Welcome. I'm Kinetic Symphony. I hunt down and report on mysterious and weird true stories, from glitches to the paranormal. There are solid stories to fall asleep to as well. This is my monthly compendium of case reports, between the 1st to the 22nd of February, 2021. Case file number 37 to 60. Case file number 37. Written by user Theoway1234. A relaxing day in the woods by a stream. Time to leave. He felt watched though. Then he saw himself peering from the edge of a tree. I've read some great retellings on the sub and thought I'd share my own. In short, I'm a skeptic about pretty much anything supernatural, but there are two events in my life that still give me chills to this day which I cannot explain. This happened many years ago. I was a teenager hanging out with my brother and friend. We lived in a rural area. We got bored as teenagers do and decided to ride our bikes through a wooded area to check out a nearby stream. Heavy rain had passed through earlier in the day, so we were curious to see if the stream was fast flowing. We got to the stream, nothing too exciting there, and chilled out for a few hours. In the afternoon, we decided to head back. My brother and friend jumped on their bikes and started riding ahead of me. I got onto my bike and had a strange feeling like I was being watched. I scanned the trees surrounding me, when suddenly, Someone leaned out to the side of a large tree no more than 25 feet away from me. This person had a big grin on their face. Most importantly, this person was me. I was staring at another me, grinning at myself from behind a tree. I was frozen. I wanted to yell but I was so confused and terrified that no words would come out. I remember the terrible feeling of dread that washed over me. I blinked rubbed my eyes, and the apparition had vanished. I rode hell for leather back home, and I don't think I slept for a week. I went back to the stream a few more times in my youth with my friends, and nothing like this ever happened again. The logical part of my brain wants to say that my eyes were playing tricks on me that day, but the part that remembers what happened, how clear it was, and the feeling of absolute terror and confusion will never let me just push this memory aside. Case Notes, file number 37. This reminds me of the Prisoner of Azkaban novel from the Harry Potter series. Speaking of time travel, Hermione says that time travel is dangerous and can cause irreparable brain damage, insanity if your other past sees your future self. I wonder if something similar to this happened to you. Curious though that you witness your other self grinning. Did this other version of yourself appear older or exactly the same as you? What about the details of, say, clothing, same thing you were wearing that day? The author of the story responded to my questions, saying, The other me was the same age as me and wearing exactly the same outfit as I was that day. I remember it clearly, a black hoodie with one green sleeve and one pink sleeve. Continuing my thoughts, Hmm, this would seem to rule out the time travel, well, I don't even want to call it a theory, just something that popped into my head. It's just very odd, isn't it? Doppelganger indeed. But at least nothing else happened, and you never saw it again. So, it didn't have nefarious intent, I don't think. Case file number 38. Written by user 8th Immortal. Recounting past events in an old house, haunted by something beyond our realm. About 15 years ago, I was living with my ex-girlfriend, my sister, and her husband in an old house not far from town. Within the first few weeks of living there, strange things were happening regularly. Lights going out randomly, noises upstairs. At one point, one of the windows at the back of the house was cut like someone went at it with a pair of glass cutters trying to break in but gave up on it and left. Creepy stuff like that. That was bad enough. But things got pretty severe as time went on. One week in particular was crazy. The first thing that happened that week was on a Tuesday night. Everyone was working. I was home alone watching TV when I noticed our cat was acting weird. Backed into a corner and arched up like it was scared of something. When I went to get up, the electricity went out in the house and it was pitch black inside. 
The moment that happened, I heard really loud footsteps running down the stairs to me. I got up and braced myself for whatever it was, but there was nothing there. I gathered myself and went outside to the front garden to check if the other house lights were on, but my house was the only one that was dark. I went to the fuse box and reset the trip switch. Everything returned to normal. A few days later, I think it was on a Thursday, we were all in the living room watching a movie with pizza, lights on, good atmosphere in the house, when out of nowhere, a massive bang happens upstairs. We go up to check it out, and I went into our bedroom and saw my bedside table in the middle of the room. The worst and last thing that happened to me was on a Saturday night. I'll never forget this. It still gives me chills when I think about it. We go to bed, everything normal, watching a movie to fall asleep to. I wake up facing the wall and glance at the alarm clock. It reads 3.13. I turn over to go back to sleep and see my ex standing in the middle of the room. Confused, I begin to sit up and ask her what's up. But as I start to sit up, I realize my ex is asleep in the bed next to me. A surge of fear runs through me, and I am frozen to the spot. My eyes adjust and I barely make out the figure, a young girl in a nightdress with a cartoon character on it, soaking wet with her head down looking at the floor. I can hear the water drop onto the carpet, and I'm just sitting there, freaking shocked. I couldn't believe it. After a couple of seconds, it kinda melts away, like fades out of sight. I got up, turned on the lights, trying to tell myself that this was just a night terror or something. But the problem with that was, there was a goddamn wet patch where she was standing. Moved out shortly after that, can still picture her to this day though. God damn, was it the creepiest thing I've ever experienced. Case Notes, file number 38. I've never quite chalked it up to the paranormal, but perhaps I should have. When I was a teenager, I was living in a house, a small one, in the forest. It was nighttime, and I was watching TV alone. I heard a massive bang on the door, so loud it sounded like the force of it should have collapsed the entire house. I went to check and there was absolutely no one and nothing outside. Nothing else weird ever happened to me in that place, so I never thought of any sort of presence or spirits or anything like that. I don't know what I thought, I just kinda put it out of my mind. For you though, the last bit is what perplexes me, that your carpet was still wet even after this entity or spirit vanished away. I've never heard of a lingering effect like that. The water on her was real, not just a visual representation. Wow. Case file number 39, written by user, seriously, squirrely. A case of a long walk, turning into an entirely different setting, from bleak, gloomy and cold, to sunny, bright and warm, a few steps later. As a teenager, I lived in a dead-end neighborhood, a mile into an expansive state forest in a rural Connecticut town, with a lot of history and supposedly haunted graveyard. This town had a heavy sort of energy, and I had plenty of spooky little glitch experiences while living there. For instance, seeing movements in my peripheral vision. But the one big glitch which I remember so vividly all this time later, happened on a cloudy, grey November afternoon, when I decided to go on one of my many wooded adventures. Usually, I would do these excursions with neighborhood friends, but this day, I was alone. I started out from my backyard and went straight into the woods to explore a section I was less familiar with. As I wandered deeper, the day became paler and gloomier. The trees were bare or had a few crispy brown leaves barely clinging to their branches, and the air was cool, a typical New England November day in the woods. It was nearing dusk, but I pressed on, wanting to see how far I could get. Suddenly, I found myself stepping out of the grey, wintry woods into an old rutted dirt road with worn wheel tracks and humps of green grass. It was no longer cold and grey, it was sunny, the sky was clear and blue, and the trees were full of green leaves all along the trail. There was a gentle warm breeze, it smelled like summer. I stopped, startled at the abrupt change, feeling as if I had just entered another world. It was so pleasant and inviting, I wasn't scared. It was so beautiful and peaceful. 
I felt this overwhelming urge to walk down the path and see where it would take me. But noting the time, and knowing it was cold and dusky mere seconds before I stepped into this inexplicable sunshine, I decided I didn't have the time to explore this lush, tempting road, especially since doing so would change my direction, and I was concerned about getting disoriented and not being able to find my way home in what should have been the rapidly darkening evening. Instead, I decided to come back the next day with a friend. I turned around and stepped back off the trail into the chilly November gloom and headed home via the same straight line I had plotted. I couldn't stop thinking about that place. It was so surreal and peaceful. It had no business being that green and sunny. The next day, I recruited a friend, determined to show her, but we couldn't find the trail. I never found it again, even though I remembered exactly how I got there and tried to find it several times after. Sometimes I think back on that day, all those years ago, and wonder why it was there and what would have happened if I had decided to walk down that path. Has anyone else had something like this happen to them? Case Notes, File Number 39 This reminds me of an older glitch I had read before, an account by someone describing their grandparents that were out for a walk and they entered their town like normal, but it was a different town than they remembered. The pathing was different, the roads, the buildings, everything was a little weird, not like they had remembered. Eventually though, they get back home, but they never could return to that same place even after walking down every road in the city. Seems like there are temporary portals or wormholes that connect us to different alternate realities, but we have no perception of them, we can't even feel the transition, it just kinda happens, randomly. Did you experience any time distortions after returning home? The author responded to my comment, saying, Hi, I didn't experience any time distortion that I'm aware of. Perhaps you're right though, about portals, wormholes, or the like, that we can't even feel them. They also remembered the story I was describing, and they included a link to it. Case file number 40, written by user Okoy. Her dad takes her pet dog for a walk. She hears him come back, pets her dog, then realizes neither her dad or her dog actually returned yet. A little while ago, I'd say a year ago, I was standing in the hallway in my house where there are two doors on the right hand side going down and a door at the end. The first door was the pantry and the second door was the bathroom. I was standing by the pantry door, I think I was debating what food I wanted or something, and my dad had taken my dog, Mason, for a walk. The door at the end of the hall opens into a mudroom, which then has a side door where we usually go in. Well, I heard the sounds of the side door open, and I heard my dog's collar jingling. Then the door at the end of the hallway opened up, presumably by my dad, and I saw my dog, Mason, run down the hallway. I put out my hand to pet him as he runs by. He continues and I see him run in the direction of the stairs and I assume he ran upstairs to my mom. For some reason, I felt like something was off because he just ran forward like a simulation and didn't stop and say hello to me. So I called to my mom and asked if Mason was up there with her and she said no and that my dad hadn't arrived home yet with Mason. My heart stopped and I realized that something was wrong. I waited and later my dad came in and let Mason in too, so my dad hadn't come home yet, letting my dog in, even though I had seen, heard, and petted Mason. Three of my senses had been off, and I can't to this day understand how. At this point I just accepted the fact that we're probably in a computer simulation, or we're being experimented on. I've never hallucinated anything like that before, and I haven't since but I can't get over it, and I won't let myself be convinced that it was nothing, because it was something. Case Notes, File Number 40 This brings us to the spawn of the glitch in the Matrix labeling itself, Neo in the Matrix seeing the black cat walk by twice, only in your case the déjà vu happened over minutes, not seconds. Truly inexplicable, at least by conventional means. Your senses simply lied to you or the simulation repeated its scripted scenario. I wonder, are we just players? Part of a play, like the Truman Show? Or is it a simulation that's scripted? Things happen to us, we are players in control, 
But like in a video game, we have limited control, things we can't quite do, and there are areas or events that are just supposed to happen. Well, I don't know, I'm just the guy speculating. But it is interesting, isn't it? Case file number 41. Written by user Audacious Boo. It was a cold Christmas Eve in Texas. She and her sister went out to play outside with her new telescope. What they saw baffled them, burning a memory into the minds that has endured for decades. I was nine. It was Christmas Eve, 1988, and my family's Christmas Eve party was winding down. My grandma was digging through the remnants of boxes, bows, and wrapping papers from our family's white elephant gift exchange to see what she could salvage for next year. My mom and aunt were laughing and trading stories of holidays past. My two older half-sisters, Sherry and Penny, who were adults at the time, being 18 and 20 years older than me, were picking over the leftovers on the dining room table. I was sitting near the back of the Christmas tree, where three gifts with my name on them remained. These were from my mom and grandma, and as it was a tradition that I could only open one gift before bedtime on Christmas Eve, the rest I had to wait and open my Santa gifts on Christmas morning. I assessed the three packages for some time before making my selection. It was nearing midnight. I had to be in bed soon, so I decided to just pick the biggest because it had weight, and it didn't sound like clothes when I shook it. When my mom said it was time, I eagerly unwrapped the gift. At my grandma's unspoken request, I was careful not to rip the paper or mess up the bow and set them aside as my gift was revealed. It was a telescope. It wasn't a high quality count the rings of Saturn type though. It was small, mostly made of plastic, and still had the $14.99 price sticker on the box. I was gracious, though I was not impressed. Not because of the quality. I didn't know the difference between a nice telescope and a cheap toy one, but because I simply had no interest in its function, and even if I was interested in what it did, the simple assembly required to make it work exceeded the grasp of my exceptionally short attention span. Now my sister Sherry is the oldest, and to me back then, she was like a bossy hall monitor. She had no real authority, but that didn't stop her from trying to run everything. I'm 41 now and she is 61 and seriously, not much has changed in that aspect. My other sister Penny is just two years younger than Sherry, so she would have been 29 at the time. She was different, a combination of unattended schizophrenia and drug abuse made her the wild card, meaning you never knew what you were going to get with her. On this night, she had managed to maintain a level of normalcy, a jovial mood, Though under any circumstances at the time, and regardless of her behavior, her personality seemed more comparable to mine rather than to any of the adults in the room. Penny took an enthusiastic interest in my new gift, and asked if we could go out back and test it out. I agreed, knowing that my compliance would afford me a bit more time before I had to go to bed, and being a child on the night before Christmas, I was naturally restless. Penny and I ascended onto the back porch. In no time at all, my sister had the telescope assembled and in position for celestial exploration. It took her a bit longer to find a point of focus and adjust all the little knobs for optimal viewing. So while she was occupied with that, my attention was drawn to the icicles that had formed on the awning and the dog's water bowl that had turned to solid ice. Being a Texan, this isn't generally common, even for December though it isn't generally uncommon either. Our winters are short, and much like my eccentric sister, you never know what you're going to get when it arrives. I feel the need to preface this next part of the story with two very important points. First, I need to say that my memory of this incident, however perplexing, is as clear and as vivid to me now as the very night it occurred, so this is a true and accurate account. Secondly, this entire event lasted no more than a minute, and while I must describe these events in succession, many of them occurred all at once. I had just taken off my mitten so I could utilize the full function of my hands and fingers for grasping, when I heard Penny exclaim in amusement, Whoa, cool! 
Well, I had no interest at all in stargazing and was far more focused on trying to retrieve the perfect icicle from the awning, using a garden hoe. I didn't even look up from what I was doing, figuring she had managed to find something bright to look at, and that just meant I had a bit more time to spend on trying to dislodge the big beautiful icicle before it melted. Then it occurred to me that the icicle was melting, and quite rapidly so, when just moments before it was still in the process of forming. Now it's dripping like a leaky faucet, and what was even stranger was that all this water was dripping around me, yet it made no sound. Nothing made a sound at all, not the water or the wind, or the highway in the distance, not even my sister tinkering with the telescope. When the dripping slowed, and I don't mean that in the sense that there was more time between each drop, but rather the droplets were taking longer to fall to the ground. Confused as I was, I immediately looked over at my sister and found her standing upright, not bent over peering into the telescope, but staring out into the yard. I turned to match her gaze, and what I saw completely eluded the grasp of my nine-year-old comprehension. Hovering a mere four feet above my backyard fence was an almond-shaped capsule about the size of a pontoon boat. It was a metallic color, resembling chrome with no discernible crevices, no windows, no doors. It was completely flush, and even though it had no fixtures for lights to shine from, the area around it was completely illuminated as light reflected off of millions of water droplets now suspended in mid-air. I was struck with fear and confusion as I broke my gaze just long enough to look over at my sister, searching for some sort of sign as to what this thing was, and if we were in any danger. Penny looked over at me, grinning from ear to ear. Cindy Boo, it's a UFO! I didn't hear her say it, and her lips didn't move. But that's what she said. We both looked back at the object, and it tilted slightly downward. At this angle, it appeared to be spinning as a flash of iridescent lights made one complete rotation around its exterior. Then in a split second, it shot straight up and disappeared into the night sky. Darkness resumed, along with all the sounds of the night and the crisp chill of the air. I stood there, dumbfounded, amazed, and terrified by what I'd just experienced, while at the same time, I felt relief that it was over, and even a certain sense of excitement. I didn't know whether to run away, cry, or laugh. I looked over at my sister, wanting to run to her, but still frozen to the place I stood, as if all my cognitive resources were occupied, trying to process everything. I was momentarily unable to communicate movement to my legs. Penny was not frightened by what we had just witnessed. She seemed just as blissful as I'd ever seen her before, and while at times I found that refreshing, in this instance, it confused me. I needed to observe a regular adult response. Reclaiming the use of my legs, I ran towards the door, saying, Let's go tell mom! Yeah! Penny agreed and followed me through the back door. I was glad she was there and had my back. I knew there was no way my mom would believe a spaceship story if it had been only me recounting it. Running in with my Kmart telescope, we entered the dining room where my mom stood, laughing as my grandma sang the phrase, We won't go until we get some. I exclaimed, Mom, me and Penny just saw a- I briefly forgot what my sister had called it, but she chimed in to assist. A UFO, Penny injected. You did? With your new telescope? Mom inquired. No, it was in the backyard by my fort, right above the fence, and I wanted to tell her everything all at once, but I just wasn't fast or articulate enough to express what had all transpired. My mom was a regular adult who saw me as an imaginative child, and my sister as well, as a somewhat mild version of the crazy person she expected to show by the end of the night. Maybe it was Santa. I hope he doesn't pass you up because you're not in bed. I didn't believe in Santa Claus. I never did. I just pretended for as long as I could for extra presents. I did understand the situation I was in though. I knew mom was done for the night and wanted me to go to bed so she could set up the Santa gifts and finally get some rest herself. Not to mention, she was usually well within the bounds of good insight by steering away from conversations featuring supernatural events with my sister. It just so happened that on this occasion, it was all true, and I understood that she would never know that. 
Shortly after that, a movie came out called Fire in the Sky, starring D.B. Sweeney, a based on true events film about a small town man who was allegedly abducted by aliens, experimented on, and returned several days later. The movie, coupled with my memory of that event, terrified me beyond expression causing me to have night terrors throughout my childhood about the visitors returning to claim me, and I'm certain it initiated my lifelong battle with sleep paralysis dreams. I was so terrified I wouldn't watch or read anything at all that had to do with extraterrestrials, and I wouldn't speak of it again for nearly 30 years. Somewhere in that period of time, I convinced myself that the entire event had been a terrible nightmare that I had just happened to remember every single detail of down to the mittens I was wearing, where they landed on the ground, when I took them off, and the rush of heat I felt, hot on my cheeks from the fireplace when I ran back into the house that night. My sister was estranged for many years throughout my childhood, as her condition got worse before it began to get better finally. She got clean and got on the right meds, and a few years ago, she came to live with us. The first week she was here, we spent a lot of time talking about different things that had happened over the years, things she'd said and done. I discovered that she had barely any recollection of a great deal of it, claiming, that must have been the other me. I guess I got caught up in the spirit of sharing, or I got brave or something, but I decided to ask her about that night during one of our talks. Do you remember that one Christmas Eve? Is all I got out of my mouth before she responded with, you mean the night where we saw that UFO in the backyard? That's a memory that stuck. I remember it as clear as yesterday. She then proceeded to describe the experience from her perspective with very little variation from my own experience. So there it is. It was not a dream. It was not my nine-year-old imagination. All those little details that made no sense, the ones I used to tell myself it didn't happen, are the same details that later on, Affirm the reality of it. I saw a UFO in my backyard on Christmas Eve, 1988. I was 9 years old. Case Notes, File Number 41 There are many UFO accounts I believe to be fictional, intended to misdirect people or garner personal attention, fame, money. This is not one of those accounts. What a riveting way to describe your experience. I don't have much to add on a personal account, since I've never witnessed any sort of alien interaction at all, nothing strange in the skies either. One thing that excites me, outside of the clear superiority of these aliens, technologically speaking, is the proof positive that we've achieved so far as a species is as limited as cavemen achieving fire. Just the fact that gravity can be manipulated as they are able to, that alone would be a groundbreaking paradigm shift in every respect. I mean, exploring the stars, colonizing Mars, asteroid belts, etc. all becomes trivial if we manage to achieve that level of technology. How they do it, of course, is well beyond us for now. And maybe it should remain that way. As the author replied, saying that such technology would be dangerous for us at the moment. And perhaps she's correct. We have to get there of our own accord, if we're able to. Case file number 42 written by user Arijas, a case of dropped box cutters vanishing completely, then reappearing later in his manager's office. I work as an overnight stalker in a grocery store in my city. Part of my job, of course, is opening boxes. Every employee is given a box cutter with their name on it, so if it gets lost, we know who to return it to. We also have these carts we push around that carry the boxes we stock giving us a place to set things we aren't actively using. I cut open a box, set my box cutter on the cart, then went to set the box on the cart as well, so I could pull things out of it. In that process, the box knocked my box cutter on the ground. I leaned over to pick it up, but it was gone. I couldn't find it, so I asked my manager for a spare. Important, the spares don't have our names on them. Towards the end of my shift, I'm walking to the back room and my manager comes up, confused, holding my box cutter and says, hey, this was somehow on my desk. Her office is locked during working hours because she's on the floor helping us. So how my box cutter got from my section to her desk through a locked door is beyond me, 
but you bet I'll be attaching it to my belt loop from now on. Case Notes, File Number 42 Ah, another classic vanishing story object. These touch my brain especially, given that it's the only glitch I've personally experienced. A tennis ball just vanishing as I go to throw it. Anyways, per your glitch, if I were to offer a solution of the mundane realm, perhaps the box cutter fell on the ground, bounced far away out of sight, somehow, any nooks or crannies it could have wound up in, and then another fellow employee found it and put it on your manager's desk. The only problem with that, of course, is you said the manager's office is always locked, so I'm not sure how they got around that. Yeah, weird. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like, and also subscribe on up. Case file number 43, written by user 2D Good Shoes. She's a skeptic, but her husband manifests peculiar coincidences all the time, and it's happening for her too now. My husband is very in tune with happenings, coincidences, manifestations, whatever you want to call it. I've witnessed things happen due to his intuitiveness and will. I'm a skeptic, but get a kick out of experiencing things every so often. This happened to me in just the last week, and it's had me pay attention more, although I feel like paying attention and such will not allow things to happen naturally. It just made me open my mind a little bit. The first two are related, and the last two happened just today. I have a job to restore a monument of the Ten Commandments. No comment on subject, please, it's just a job. When I got to the word Sabbath, Black Sabbath started playing on my shuffled playlist. Today when I finished the word steal, the Jane's Addiction song Been Caught Stealing started playing. My husband is a musician, guitarist, sound engineer, etc, who builds amps and pedals. He showed me a video over the weekend of an ultra rare pedal, one that costs over $3,000 on average. Today, one of my coworkers returned a book he borrowed from me. And before he left, another coworker passed by and called out to him asking if he got rid of some amp he had for sale. I said my husband collects vintage gear and is always looking out for stuff. They continued talking, and the first coworker mentioned he was thinking of selling his clone, and I said, a centaur? And he gave me goosebumps. Not just because he owned this ultra rare sought after pedal, but because it was fresh on my mind. And before my husband showed me the video, I had never heard of it before, and here is someone just randomly talking about it. There have been other occurrences here and there in my life that made me pause, but I usually forget about them. When we started dating, he and I would find single dimes everywhere in odd places. He felt there was something about it, but I just thought it was neat. About four years ago, we, us and our two kids, stopped at an auto parts store on the way out of town to visit a museum for Father's Day so he could pick up something. He grabbed a small pack of fuses near the register. He didn't need the fuses, but just bought them. On the way to the museum, we encountered a man with a broken down motorcycle. My husband rides motorcycles and always has his tools in his truck. He pulled over and asked if he could help. The man didn't have any tools with him, he said he took off his saddlebag because he wasn't going far from home, and his wife wasn't home to bring him anything. They inspected the problem, and all the guy needed was a fuse, just like the one he bought earlier. Case Notes, file number 43. This is like describing synergy with the universe, and for you with your husband, it's simpatico, as they say. Do you also finish each other's sentences? Hmm. I had a girlfriend a while back where everything just meshed, flowed like water down a mountain, uninhibited by any obstacles, always able to find the path of least resistance. Sometimes people are just, I don't want to say destined, but they fit together perfectly, almost like Lego pieces. The best I can describe the feeling is as being, when life feels light, it's not just connections between people, it's just when things flow. Some days it's as if a weight is on our shoulders, we're not plugged in. Your husband appears to be just so, implanted within the system of the universe. If we call that connected to the code, or just spiritual, whatever it fundamentally is, I don't doubt he's there. Case file number 44, written by user DJH, 
1982. On command nearly 20 years ago, aboard the USS Philippine Sea, near the Bermuda Triangle, his commanding officer hands him a sheet to sign, then does the same thing in the same way a few minutes later. Déjà vu? Something weird happened to me back in 2001 or 2003, somewhere in that region. I was in the Navy and our ship, the USS Philippine Sea, was deployed for training just north of the Bermuda Triangle. Anyways, I'm sitting there in sonar control for watch standing, watching the sonar display, when the rest of the division files in for the morning muster. After the division was dismissed, my boss hands me a sheet of paper and asks me to sign it. It was a health risk screening form for the PRT the crew would have to undergo upon returning to port, Mayport, Florida. I asked to borrow his pen so I could sign the form. Mine was out of ink, and then handed it back to him. Five minutes later, the whole thing repeated itself. I don't mean like déjà vu, I mean like reality itself repeated on a loop with every single detail involved. My boss walked up to me, handed me the same form, and I was so annoyed when I asked why he's having me sign the same stupid form again, tired from the long night. He looked so confused. Once again, I asked him for his pen and signed the form. I was just baffled. Throughout the rest of the day, I asked him repeatedly if he had pulled some prank on me, but he continued to deny it. Finally, at the end of the day, he realized that something strange had indeed happened to me. I guess he realized after a while how genuine I was being and knew that I wasn't given to exaggerations. I told them about the glitch and how no one else seemed to notice it. Was it our ship's proximity to the Bermuda Triangle? Who knows? It never happened to me again, but it did happen. Case Notes, file number 44. Given that you were watching the sonar screen, is there any time display on it? If so, did you notice time itself repeating? Did the clock reset back, or was it simply your boss giving you the form a second time, but without noticing a time distortion too? It's been a long time, I know, so it's understandable if you don't recall that detail. The author responded to my question, saying, That is a great question. I never even thought to do that at the time. All I can tell you is that my boss approached me to sign the risk factor screening form. Then a few minutes later, the whole thing repeated itself. Great idea, I was just too tired and disoriented from what was transpiring to think of it. I guess I'm not a very good time traveler. <laughs> Case file number 45, written by user Hot Topic Mall Rat. On a business trip with family down in Monaco, she felt inexplicably drawn by the moon towards the ocean. Let me start by saying I've always been a skeptic. I'm new to this sub, and while I've always loved the paranormal, I can't say I've always believed in it. This is one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced and I don't understand it. I, female 20 at the time, have no history of mental illnesses other than depression and anxiety when I was in my teens. I don't much dabble in the occult anymore, though I did when I was super little. I don't know if this means anything to anyone, but I'm an American with third generation Sicilian blood. I won't give my last name, but it translates to fish. My family has been part of Sicily for so long, I believe there is even a town named after us. We've been fishermen since the Romans, I think. And even after we moved to America, we kept fishing until my dad was born. I don't super believe in past lives or ancestral help, so I've never assumed my fascination with the ocean was much more than just enjoying the water. I only bring this up because I've got a medium friend who thinks it could be related. I grew up in California and loved the ocean. I wanted to be as close to it as I could. My grandfather passed away, and so I didn't grow up fishing at all, but I was weirdly comforted by it. Anyway, one day I got to go with my mom on a business trip to Monaco. It was my first time leaving America, and I didn't realize it, but it was going to be my first time in the Mediterranean Sea. I remember the night we arrived. There was a huge company party at the hotel we were staying at, but I couldn't focus on what was going on. I needed to go. I was feeling super weird, not like anxiety, but like there was something I was forgetting. I told my mom I'd be right back and went to the front of the hotel. I wasn't sure what I was doing, but I felt like I had to go. 
as soon as I got away from the hotel. I looked up and saw the reddest largest harvest moon I'd ever seen. It was as if a shock ran through me, through my whole body. Like I wasn't supposed to be seeing it, but I couldn't look away. And then like that, I felt pulled to the ocean. I took off my shoes and walked to the beach. If you don't know, Monaco does not have naturally sandy beaches. They're all incredibly rocky, but it was like I could feel the pain of the rocks, but I had to keep moving towards the ocean. There was a man there, and I remember him saying something to me, but I can't remember what it was. It was too dark to make out what he looked like. I walked past him and kept going until I reached the ocean, and the water was up to my knees. I kept looking up at the red moon. I don't know for how long I was there, but I remember feeling whole, completed. I remember not wanting to leave, like I was supposed to be here, and any time I wasn't would be wasted. It was like a weird inner euphoria. When I eventually did pull away, it was like I was snapped back to reality. My feet hurt from the rocks, I wanted my jacket. I remember thinking, what the hell are you doing out here barefoot in an ocean you don't know in the middle of the night? And I ran back. Nothing like that has ever happened again. Have any of you been through anything like this before? It felt like a trance. Case Notes, file number 45. Trance-like is exactly how I'd describe it too. Some people suggest our draw to the moon is even baked into our very DNA, as well to be drawn to the healing salts of the ocean. It extends beyond our conscious processing. I'm sure the water felt a bit cold, the sharp jags of those rocks biting into the soles of your feet, and yet you had no choice but to continue walking in. It was like you were ensnared by the waves of the ocean. The moon and the ocean are interconnected because of tidal forces, so there is some logic there, I suppose. It's like an ancestral pull that was, well, contrarily pushing you in. Incredible. When I was 19, 11 years ago, my goodness, I'm getting old. Anyways, back then I was actually homeless and I was in Florida. I know the one thing that gave me peace was just being on the beach. There was something so calming, just looking at the waves crashing on the beach again and again and again in a rhythmic, almost like a meditation. Yeah, there's something to it. Case file number 46, written by user Oi Evolve I. He's a cop on patrol duty. In a split second, he's rushed into a high speed chase. He realizes he's going to die, but he doesn't. I have only told two other people this story, my fiance and my therapist. A few years ago, I worked as a deputy sheriff in a small county in Oklahoma. I was fortunate enough to work in the county where I grew up, so I already knew my patrol area long before I was tasked to patrol it. One particular day, I had signed on and was driving into the station, as I observed a car ahead of me who appeared to be going pretty fast. I clocked him at 95 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone, so there was no choice but to stop this car. As it passed me, I flipped a U-turn on it, and I heard the car's engine rev and the gear drop. It was a Dodge Challenger SRT, and before I even made the complete turn, I knew I was in a pursuit. I immediately felt the adrenaline rush throughout my body, but I was able to follow them for several miles at very fast speeds, until I came to this particular T-intersection. I've known about the T intersection since I was a kid, and I had worked a crash two weeks prior in which a teenage kid had died by going too fast and not seeing the T in enough time. As I am approaching the T, heading north in this pursuit, I look down and see my speed at 123, and I start to panic because I'm already three houses, maybe 2,000 feet from the T. I know there's no way I'm going to be able to make this stop, and I accept the fact that I'm about to die. I remember this weird feeling washing over me, and it was almost like I blinked and I was past the intersection heading east at 80 miles per hour, directly behind the suspect, who was a good 15 seconds in front of me, maybe a few miles. I cannot for the life of me make any sense of this, and honestly, I am a bit shaky as I write this on my phone. I have searched for years trying to find any kind of explanation, but the two people I told made me feel like I was crazy for even mentioning it. Case Notes, file number 46. 
You're not crazy, not in the slightest. These anomalies happen very often, and in my estimation, far more than people will let on, because they don't want to be thought of as insane, and I don't blame them. What I can say for your experience is a resemblance to quantum immortality, which just means a consciousness transfer, many universes with us's in them, though in these cases the cause of death and often that death is vividly etched into the memory of the traveler. You remember your death. It's possible if one closes their eyes before dying, that these memories don't transfer. I don't know, I mean that's pure speculation. But sometimes people don't remember, so I'm not sure why. Case file number 47, written by user Purple Oak 6611 Overnight as she slept, someone, something, or some force took a picture with editing on her phone. So this happened to me, 18 female, a few years back. I've tried telling people about this, but no one believes me. I hope this doesn't go against the technological rule, because I have no idea how to explain it, but if there is an explanation, I would love to hear it. Okay, so just for some context, I have very severe sleep apnea, which causes me to wake up periodically throughout the night because I stop breathing, so I'm constantly exhausted. Because of this, I tend to sleep over 8 hours a day, and that sleep is usually like me being more unconscious than it is normal sleep. I'm also very hard to wake. So during this time, I would come home from school, take off my shoes, and directly pass out for at least 3-4 to four hours. On the day this happened, I had a long day at school, so when I got home I was extremely tired. I took off my glasses and shoes and fell asleep instantaneously, with the lights on and everything. It was pretty normal to say the least. Well, a few days after that, I was scrolling through my photo album on my phone. As you all know, there are separate folders for screenshots, photo edits, etc. So while going through the photos, I came across this one in my camera folder. This one was for photos taken directly from the camera on my phone. Normally, if you edit a picture, the original photo would stay in the camera album, and the freshly edited version would go to the photo editor album, just trying to make the context clear. The photo was a picture of my open glasses on my bed. It had to have been taken with the phone turned sideways, since it was a wide shot. I wasn't in the photo, just my bed with a red sheet, and my glasses opened up in the center. And at the bottom of the picture, it said, I have come here surpassing the limits of time and space. Now I have to reiterate here, I did not take this photo, and I did not edit this photo. The photo with the text included was in my camera album, not my photo editor album. I do realize this could be edited, but I honestly have no idea how, and I know that none of the others in my house knew how to either. I also did have a passcode on my phone, which no one in my house knew, so if they did take the photo, there was no way they could have edited it without unlocking the phone somehow. I showed my parents, even if the text was fake or whatever. At the very least, someone had come into my room, taken my glasses off my nightstand, opened them up and put them on my bed, taken a picture with my phone and then left. What the hell? They just laughed it off before I could even finish explaining to them, which was the same reaction I've gotten with anyone else I've tried to tell. I just don't understand how this could have happened by any normal means. I've gone through so many different scenarios in my head and I just can't explain this one. It still freaks me out, thinking that at the very least, someone came into my room and took pictures while I was sleeping. I just really hope nothing like this happens again. Also, just a quick side note, I have the phone on which the picture appeared, but the screen has completely blacked out, it's kind of fried. I've tried getting my photos on it transferred to my computer, but it keeps popping up errors. If anyone has any tips on how to recover these photos, I'd love to hear them. Edit. So I've seen a lot of the same responses and questions about my post, so there are a few things I want to mention. I'm in the process of getting my sleep apnea treated. At the beginning of 2020, I got my tonsils and adenoids removed. I only found out I had sleep apnea a few months before the surgery, but I think it was worthy to mention since I'm a very heavy sleeper due to that. It has helped, but I need to get another sleep study to find out if I still need a CPAP machine or not 
but overall I'm doing much better than before. While I've never had issues with sleepwalking, it is technically possible that I could have done this. I'm just not sure how I could have done a file transfer, which, again, I don't know how to do, or edit the photo without waking up. But I'm not ruling it out and will be asking my family if they've ever seen any signs of sleepwalking before. I plan on doing a Samsung broken screen recovery within the next few days. Hopefully I can get the photo. Until then, here's the best description I can give of the photo. I was sleeping in my bedroom at the time. As for sleeping positions, while I'm not too sure because I wasn't awake, from not being able to see myself in the photo and from my knowledge of how I sleep, I was most likely curled up next to and facing the wall. The bed was in the corner of the room. I would probably have had my back turned. I do believe the photo was taken at the farthest corner of my bed, the one that was fully exposed to my room. It looked like someone was holding the phone while standing, a top-down shot, but I think it was either zoomed in or the phone was held closer to the glasses, but it was definitely in the air, hovering over the glasses. The position of the glasses seemed to have been placed deliberately. They had been opened all the way and placed down with care. It's not how I would have left them, but I can't be for sure. The font used was pretty average, just white text with a very normal looking font, but it's possible it might have been italicized, although I'm not entirely sure. While this photo shook me, I still don't think it was just some crazy stranger who broke into my house or anything. I don't think I was being stalked or was in any danger. Talking and thinking about it still makes me feel weird though, but I think it's something else. I was 14 at the time this took place in the late months of 2015, early months of 2016. I really appreciate all of the suggestions on here, and while I know nothing has been solved yet, or will ever be, just getting the chance to explain this without being brushed aside has honestly made me feel a lot better about the situation. I do plan on updating again, at least when I can get the photo. Thanks again for the support. I do appreciate it. Case Notes, file number 47. Indeed, some people suggest that sleep apnea might be a signal that you also sleepwalk, but this doesn't seem like a totally valid solution because, to my knowledge, we don't perform complex tasks like photo editing while in the limited state of awareness of sleepwalking. Maybe you're an exception though? It's a strange scenario even if that is the solution. What I would suggest is, if you have any worries about something like this happening again, set up a simple camera in your room. Quite a few of them you can affix to the corners, and they're cheap. If something unusual happens again, you'll know exactly what caused it. Although I know this was 4 years ago, but still, who knows? I think we should all have cameras in our rooms to be honest. Sometimes weird stuff happens in there, even like sleep paralysis episodes. If you have a camera, you can actually see what's going on, if anything weird really did happen. So that's my recommendation for the day. Case file number 48, written by user, I'm Ricky Spanish. Late at night dozing off watching TV. Then a stern, whispery voice tells you to go to sleep. What do you do? 12 years ago, I met my wife. She has a very close family, and I was welcomed in by most of them pretty quickly. We would spend a lot of time at one of our sister's houses when we wanted to hang out. On one visit, the whole family was over having dinner. The sister that lived in this house said something about the guy in the garage keeping her up all night with his tools banging around. Everyone empathized and just kept eating. I asked what they were talking about. They said the previous owner of the house was an older guy that spent most of his time in the garage working on his vehicles. One time there was some kind of explosion and he died in an ambulance on his way to the hospital. Now they can hear him in the garage most nights working on things. I figured they were just pulling my leg, since I was new to the family. My wife's brother-in-law, whose house it was, said the guy had a problem with men. He always messed with the men of the family, but not the women. Her brother then told her a story about a night he was watching TV pretty late. It was past midnight and no one else was awake. Out of nowhere, the TV volume went all the way up, then back down. Then the TV turned off, then back on again. The remote, he said, was across the room. 
At that point, he decided to walk home. I still just figured they were messing with me though. Fast forward a few months. I was having some issues at home, so I asked if I could crash on the couch for a few days. One of those nights, I was up watching TV. It was probably 2 or 3 in the morning. I kept hearing sounds from the area of the garage, but that's where the heater and water heater are located, so I chalked it up to that. I was laying on my side on the couch watching who knows what. As anyone who's ever watched TV like that knows, when the commercials come on, you flip your body to face the back of the couch, giving your neck a rest. On one of those couch facing flips, I heard a voice that sounded like it was right next to me whisper into my ear, go to sleep, quite sternly. I'm not one to screw around with things like that, so without turning around I grabbed the remote, turned off the TV, closed my eyes, and tried my best to fall asleep. The next morning I was telling them about it. They just had the I told you so face on. I've slept there since many times, but never again on the couch. And if I ever start to hear him working in the garage, I know it's bedtime. Case Notes, file number 48. I'd like to think that for myself, if I heard a mysteriously stern voice say, go to sleep, from the ether, I'd have booked it out of the house in a couple of seconds. But then I remind myself of how difficult it is to get out of bed from a comfy position, even on the couch when you're just starting to doze off. You're feeling warm and cozy and relaxed. Even a ghost telling you to go to sleep. <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't even be freaked out by that. I would just turn around and yeah, doze off. The ghost, after all, was just looking out for your health. How kind of him. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like. And also subscribe on up. Case File 49 Written by user Tani the Adventurous details a peculiar, seemingly impossible elevator in an old home. Then it was gone. Where did it take its passengers? I was 15 or 16, 33 now, and babysitting my teacher's two daughters. It was time for them to go to bed and they shared a room. They were getting situated and I was getting ready to tuck them in so I could go out and watch TV for a while. Wild thornberries, snagging some downtime. I was standing by the door talking to them for a minute and promising we could play whatever they wanted the next time I was over, when I heard music coming from their closet. I figured some toy was going off in there because I had made them pick up their room earlier and just assumed they shoved most of the toys that were out into that closet. I asked them what it was and the younger girl looked at me shocked and said she was surprised I heard it, then turned to her older sister who was staring at me as well equally surprised. I thought they were trying to play a joke on me, so I played along and went over to the closet and whipped open the cheap closet door. It was one of those closets that have sliding doors, so you can only access half of the closet. The type where the door always slides off the track, but what I saw inside was something I can't wrap my mind around. It was what I now recognize to be an elevator from the 1920s or 30s era. Two big velvet box benches lined the walls with the same color carpet, red. I remember the walls being gold and extremely shiny with a ton of white round buttons for all the different floor buttons. I remember the gold wall being extremely reflective but not being able to see my face reflected on the back wall due to the panel having small round perforations, kind of like a vent cover or a speaker. I remember not feeling scared per se. Or maybe the right word is terrified. I was a little freaked out, but I wasn't terrified. From the angle I was standing, the closet stood directly adjacent from the door to the room. The girls could not see what I was seeing, being to the far left side of the room. So I slowly closed the slider, then opened it again. It was packed to the max, with plastic tote storage bins and clothes. The interesting thing, and it could have simply been from my reaction, but the older daughter asked me simply, but very seriously, what did you see? I ended up telling them because it seemed like they knew something, and she told me she had never seen it, but the younger one had. She could hear the music though. They then begged me to let them come lay out in the living room with me, 
We all piled on the couch and watched the wild thornberries until they passed out and their mom got home. I never brought it up to the mom. I never asked the girls if they brought it up to her, and she never brought it up to me. I babysat them several times after and never had another experience. I had asked them at one point if they thought their house was haunted, and they told me they weren't sure but that part of their house while being moved had gotten lost in the forest somewhere. Like it had been moved and then forgotten in a forest for weeks. Again, this is from the mouse of young children, so I'm not quite sure what that means. But they thought it was important enough to mention, so I will too. I would love any suggestions as to what you may think was going on here. I know it happened because I spoke with the girls about it on several occasions after the fact, I know at least it wasn't some crazy vivid dream. Also, I remember thinking to myself, I won't permit myself not to believe this happened, so I made sure to study it while I was standing in front of it. I remember the inside of that elevator vividly. And lastly, there is no history of mental illness in my family history that could account for a one-time hallucination or delusion. Case Notes, File Number 49 so to me, the fact that the children in this home also knew of what you were speaking, while well, one saw it and the other just heard music related, that's what solidifies the story in my view. Whenever there are corroborating witnesses, even children, it piques my curiosity, especially when they're not led on to a conclusion. Did you happen to have time or even the thought to try pressing any of the buttons in the elevator? Of course, it's the fact that it vanished after closing and opening the closet, that's what really sends my head for a spin. Actually, I get the Chronicles of Narnia vibes reading this. Perhaps there's some kind of lore that book series was based on, closets leading to other realities somehow. The author responded to my comment, saying, Wow, very interesting take, thank you. I never did have the inclination to interact at all with it. I often think, what if I had gotten in? I asked the younger one if she did, and she told me no. She said by the time she went to get her sister and show her, it was gone. If it makes any difference, the younger sister was around 5, and the older one around 8 at the time. Another thing I've noticed about a lot of glitch stories, or maybe it's just the Bader Manoff phenomenon, but I have noticed a lot of stories where the OP was around the age of 15 or 16. Logically, it would make me think, possibly a hormonal thing. But yes, the fact that girls knew about it, without being led to that conclusion, puts that out of the question. Just another note from me. After you stated, what if I had gotten in? I actually got a little chill run down my spine while reading it. Hmm. Might just be my own bias, but that is a little bit more ominous. Maybe it's not a Chronicles of Narnia situation at all. Maybe more nefarious. What do you think? Case file number 50. Written by user Mr. Feeling Offender. It was a night out. A plane in the distance is seen, only it's frozen in mid-air. Okay, just to preface, I'm very skeptical of sightings and things of that nature because it's very easy to fabricate or doctor an image or story. After last night, I'm much more open to the idea that there are some things that we'll probably never be able to explain. So last night, I was taking out our trash bins at around 9.30pm. It gets dark around 5. So at this point, it was almost pitch black. I had my dog with me and the two bins. As I was nearing the end of my driveway, my dog just stopped and I thought nothing of it. However, in the distance over the hill, there was what looked to be an airplane just hovering, not moving at all or making any sounds. I stared at it for a good 10 seconds and it didn't even move one inch. Not even the red and green lights that are on an airplane at night blinked. I looked away for a good 2-3 to three seconds to make sure that my dog was still there and not chasing any cats, and when I turned back, it was gone. No trace of it at all, no lights, no sound, which in of itself is odd because usually you can hear airplanes, helicopters and jets, etc. from a very long distance due to how open the surrounding area is. Also, there were no clouds either so it's not a possibility that I just lost it behind a cloud. Now I would normally just write this off as a star or something explainable, however, the fact there were lights on the wings of the plane makes it impossible to do so. I have no idea what to make of this and quite frankly, I'm not sure I want to know. 
Case Notes, file number 50. I'm curious if this was specifically a plane glitch or your environment was frozen. I'm recalling a past story where there was a family in a car at a stoplight and they all appeared frozen. All the cars around them too. Even the sound seemed diminished, which you did mention from the plane, but I don't know if this is exactly the same. My theory then was that the server was just updating or something, or was lagging. It had to be paused to buffer. Maybe this also happened. Maybe it's not so much time as our perception of it given the mechanics of the servers we're running on. Case file number 51, written by user Rexlan. What he witnessed during sleep defies explanation, far beyond a lucid dream. I am 38. There's kind of a lot to say so I'll try to make it short, but I think the following is relevant to my story. I started getting attacked by demons when I was around 18. Sleep paralysis, accompanied by evil presences that appeared as silhouettes that are blacker than black. This happened until about 26 or 27. I was using drugs during most of that time, and was dabbling in some occultic things as well. I also want to add that these experiences are what ultimately made me start believing in God, Jesus, and the Holy Trinity. It's the reason I do not still suffer from this stuff anymore. I was 25 when the window thing happened. Using marijuana and pain pills. I was playing around with lucid dreaming, which I've been able to do since I was a kid. I was getting information on a website about how to increase lucid frequency and vividness. Some of these techniques are very similar to transcendental meditation. I was getting pretty into it and keeping a dream journal, trying every night to induce lucid dreams. I read on the forum that if you encounter a window or a mirror in your dream, you should go through it. One night I'm using these techniques and falling asleep, but I didn't truly fall asleep. I was, all of a sudden, floating above my bed in my room. Everything in my room was placed exactly as normal, except my window looks like it was shattered. It's giving off a white light, but not like any light I've ever seen. It's reflecting off my CPU screen and everything else. I can't see my body, but I'm not even looking for it. I'm affixed on the window, had a great urge to get over to it. I remember this being slow and painstaking. I was having to focus to inch over to it. After what seemed like 10 or more minutes, I finally reached the window. As soon as I did, I felt this feeling of pure nirvana for about 5 seconds. I mean this was like no drug or sex or anything else I've ever felt, not even close. After this fleeting feeling of pure ecstasy ended, I was just somewhere else, some other plane of existence or another dimension or reality or something. This was not like a dream, I could feel the wind blowing and the sun shining on my face. I was amazed that it felt as real as waking reality. I remember reaching down and pulling up some grass out of the dirt, just to see if it would be like real life, and it was. As vivid as this was at the time, most of this is blurry now. I did write all of it down in my dream journal, but it's now long gone, it's been 13 years or so. A few things I do remember is that there was an old house, I can't remember many details about it. There was a stone paved road heading up a hill to a stone tower. There was kind of a tavern or something inside. There were people but they didn't seem to be interested in me. That's the last I remember before I woke up in bed. I was so excited, but I didn't tell this to anyone for a long time aside from people on the lucid dream forum. I attempted this a little while longer but never achieved the same results. I eventually stopped and decided I shouldn't be doing this anymore, as I was still being overwhelmed by what seemed to be demons. I didn't want to give them any more license to torment me via the occult practices. I thought the demonic forces were connected to my dad's house, but realized that they were attached to me because they would follow me to other places I moved to. I haven't seen any demons in years. But I have had one supernatural thing happen to me where I'm currently living, that my girlfriend at the time witnessed too. That about sums it up though. The question I'm left with is, what happened? Just something that occurred solely in my headspace or is it a place that I could go back to and that other people can access? Case Notes, File Number 51 Do you know what pops into my head as I'm reading this? 
It's an older science fiction movie called Contact. In it, the main protagonist is whisked off into the great unknown via a portal ship which they built from extraterrestrial instructions sent in a signal. During this, she's almost in like a dreamlike state on a world that is beyond imagining, spectacular in its strangeness, and yet simultaneously tranquil. It was a product of her mind, I believe. But still, she did go somewhere. The camera that was attached and recording recorded, uh, I don't even remember, but many hours, whereas there was no delay at all. It took only a few seconds for the ship to drop through the portal in the center and then down below through it. Some people even suspect there are entities out there able to connect to us via our subconscious, but only when we're asleep or on heavy psychedelics. Are they demons, angels, aliens? I don't know. How did you feel in this ethereal place? Did you feel at peace or did you feel threatened? The author responded to my comments, saying, I didn't feel threatened or in danger, mostly excitement and the feeling of wanting to stay there as long as possible to explore. I didn't feel like some extraterrestrial world, more like a place that could be Earth but maybe a different time period. Many times in the New Age and occult doctrines, the user is encouraged to take a spirit guide. It can oftentimes appear as an angel, an ancestor, or even an animal. I never got that type of presence. I think the reason is because I knew if I did, it would be a demon masquerading as something helpful. What do you think? Case file number 52, written by user, Monroe Hips Poison Lips. It's a simple walk on the beach with her sister. It turns into reliving impossible events for the time period. I never thought I'd find a place where I could talk about what happened to my sister and me at the beach until I found this subreddit. This happened about 15 years ago. We were on our annual family holiday and my sister and I decided to go for a walk on the Norfolk, UK beach, which was near us. Our dog Bella, a bichon frise, loved going for walks, but today she completely refused and would not budge. We just thought it was funny how stubborn she was being and just went without her. About 30 minutes into our walk, I told my sister to watch out as there was horse waste product on our way. Up ahead we could see a woman with blonde hair on a brown horse, and we both commented on it. As she got closer, she was not on a horse, nor were there any horses around. That was quite weird to us, and we were both sure she was on a horse. Something felt very odd, but we carried on walking. About 20 minutes in, we were suddenly surrounded by hundreds of dead crabs. It seemed odd, but we also discussed that being a beach, it wasn't that out of the ordinary to see dead crabs, just not usually that many. We stopped for a bit just to enjoy the sound of the sea coming in and out. I got this sudden rush of fear over me, looked to the horizon and saw what looked to be like a torpedo going across the sea line at a steady pace. I started to tap my sister to get her attention, to show her what I could see. She was able to see it too and started to freak out. We genuinely thought the beach was going to be bombed. As the torpedo got to one end of the horizon, it turned around and started to come back. This time, as it circled back, it looked like it was opening up and inflating. I checked with my sister and she too could see everything I saw. The torpedo opened up into what looked like a boat, or what a smaller Noah's Ark would look like. The boat was bright green and yellow, but it felt like we should not be able to see the colors so clearly with the boat being so far away. The weirdest part was that we could see a man on the boat, much bigger than the boat, waving slowly and smiling as he went past. We kept looking at all the people around us and no one else was looking. Once the boat got to the end of the horizon, it turned back into a torpedo, went to the other end, then disappeared. When we got back, my mom was worried as we'd been gone for ages and she said both our phones went straight to voicemail even though they were both turned on with full battery. We were in disbelief about what we'd just seen. I've tried to research it and can't find anything that remotely touches the subject. If anyone has any ideas, please shout them out. Case Notes File Number 52 
It's like you crossed into a temporal doorway, or like a looking glass where you experienced various happenings from past time periods, but only from that physical location, and temporary of course. It was like a random access of historical events played out at a Star Trek holodeck, and they were like blending in and out. And I think you were physically there too in these moments since your mother was unable to connect with your phones even though they were fully charged and presumably would be within cell tower reach if you were in your time period. A lot of this does sound like what you'd expect from a heavy dose of mind altering substances. I'm assuming this is not the case. And again, it's the fact that your mom couldn't reach your phones that makes this so much more peculiar. Case file number 53, written by user Trafalgar D Law. It's an expedition at night in the rainforest. 40 minutes push by seemingly instantaneously, but only for him. Phone batteries drained. What the hell happened? I've wanted to share this story for a while and finally convince myself that it would be worth this subreddit's time. This is a relatively mild experience compared with a lot of things I've read on the sub, but it is still 100% true and it's the strangest thing I've ever experienced. As part of my university degree, I went to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico to do field surveys in various parts of the rainforest. We traveled across several sites looking at plants, animals, and doing a bunch of tests. This one site in particular was a sectioned off part of the rainforest about 2 miles in diameter that was semi-managed by the government. We went there once in a day walking around the site did our tests, and then went back to the hotel. The rest of the day we were allowed to relax and study our notes. Then in the evening, we headed back there to study the nightlife in the rainforest. We arrived at the site, unpacked our gear, and paired up with our buddies or groups, then went into the rainforest. We had one torch per group, so a lot of us used the torches on our phones to see where we were going. We walked around the same route as we had in the day and I was vigilant in checking my phone and its battery because I was terrified of getting lost in the dark in the rainforest. We were just over halfway with the loop around the site and I was sitting comfortably at about 80% battery as I had the foresight of fully charging before heading out. Then nothing. The last thing I remembered was admiring the reflection of the eyes of the crocodiles intently keeping watch over our group. Then when I came back too, I was on the other side of one of the villages that we had seen earlier in the day, alone. My phone was at 1% battery. I was completely separated from my group and I remember just staring into this old abandoned hut with the dim light of my phone. I immediately started to panic before I heard the laughter from another group on the opposite side of the village about 50 feet away. I rushed over and formed up with them. When I eventually reconnected with my group, they were worried and said that I was walking along, not saying anything at all, and then when we reached the village, they lost sight of me. It's like I was on autopilot. I've tried to be as rational as I can, thinking about the experience. I was tired, getting used to a new climate, and arguably not as hydrated as I should have been, which could have all contributed to this mental blackout. However, it is important to note that I have a phenomenal memory, as that is how I have learned to study and to completely forget what would have been a 40 minute walk through the rainforest at night is incredibly unlike me. Thinking back on the event, I still get chills, and the more I try to rationalize it, the more I feel like something unexplainable happened that night. My only comfort is that apart from the fear of being abandoned in the rainforest at night, I never felt threatened or in any danger. Edit. To address some more questions I've received. We were put into groups of 3 or 4 and there were 8 groups there walking in a straight line about 20 feet apart from each other with the lecturers leading the front and back. I've talked to a few people and done a few google searches and I'm not discounting the possibility that I may have had some sort of physical ailment or disassociative episode. The only thing that still eludes me is how I would have managed to walk away without being noticed by anyone and how much my phone immediately drained in that short period. Case notes, file number 53. So yeah, the phone battery draining is the detail that caught my attention the most, since outside of that, it's certainly conceivable that a human being could black out for 40 minutes. Though that would still be very strange in an otherwise healthy person. 
but the battery did drain from 80% to 1% in 40 minutes. Even with the flashlight open the entire time, at least on my phone, that wouldn't do much, maybe to 50%? And my phone isn't new. I can't explain the battery drain so it makes me think something else happened here. I know what I want to say, aliens, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Doesn't seem likely either though, because there were so many people around, 30 people. You'd think someone would have spotted a UFO, right? Hmm. Case file number 54, written by user Paranormal Nexus. What is it like to live in the same haunted house growing up for many years? Find out now. It's taken me a long time to come to terms with what happened in my house in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'm finally ready to share. To give a little background, my family, mom, dad, older brother, and I moved to Tennessee in 1995 from Mexico. We moved to a very old ranch-style home in Knox County and did not realize that this home would be the site of some of the most harrowing and terrifying experiences I would ever experience. I'm convinced that many occurrences have been suppressed in my mind, but I want to share with you the memories I do remember. My hand is shaking as I type this out, as these experiences haunt me to this day and are not easy to talk about. The activity in the house first began with the usual paranormal stuff you hear about. Missing items, misplaced or moved belongings, strange creaks and noises around the house. Nothing that can't logically be explained away. It wasn't until we decided to add a room to the home about 4-5 to five months in that crap began to hit the fan. I started to experience unusual things a few times a week to almost every single night thereafter. To give some perspective as to the layout of the home, upon entering, the living room is the first thing you see. To the left is a small hallway leading to my parents' bedroom. To the right of the living room is a very long and narrow hallway that leads to a guest room, then the room my brother and I shared for a short while. The hall ends with a bathroom and the entryway to the kitchen, with an extra room directly across from my brother and I's room. Essentially, my room was on the complete opposite end of the house from my parents' room. Anyways, now that the picture is set, I will describe several of my experiences. While my brother slept in the room, I would experience nightly terrors in which I would see someone standing in my doorway. It would never move, but the only way to describe it was a tall, shadowy figure with noticeably long, white string-like hair. It would watch me several times a week, and I would feel so terrified that all I would be able to do is cover my head with my blanket and pray it would go away. I told my parents what I had seen after the first night, but they merely chalked it up as me having a nightmare. Typical. Eventually, I got to a point where I began to sleep on my side with a blanket over my head with a small opening for me to look through. This continued on for two years until my brother got a room to himself. That's when things took a turn for the worst. I remember sleeping at night and seeing the same shadowy figure standing at my doorway. Feeling just as terrified as the previous time seeing it, I did the usual go-to and covered my face with my blanket, hoping upon covering myself it would be gone. This time was very different. Upon covering my face, the same figure was standing in the room merely feet from my bed. I panicked and covered my head again, wondering if I was going mad. Upon uncovering my head once again, I saw that it had gone, and with a sigh of relief, I turned onto my back. This was not a good move. Upon turning onto my back, I saw the same figure was now floating over my bed on the ceiling. I was on the top bunk, so you can imagine how close it is now. The only way I can accurately describe this humanoid-like entity is that it looked like a mix of grey alien with a very tall Crypt Keeper from that one show. The second I saw it, I covered my face once again and felt petrified, overcome with fear. I then felt the figure lay on top of me as I lay frozen on my back. I remember hearing it breathing, sounding like a quiet, almost asthmatic wheeze, and how cold its breath felt. I remember the distinct earthly smell emanating from its mouth as it breathed inches from my face, the only barrier being my blanket. It felt like hours passed, frozen in terror, feeling completely helpless. This occurrence was something that began to happen almost every night, and only happened to me. 
maybe because I was the youngest. Throughout my time living in that house, things progressively got worse. I would be lying in my bed reading a book with all the lights on, when I would begin to hear scratching under my bed. I would peek under and be overcome with the same paralysis I would feel at night and the feeling of the figure lying on top of me. I would feel it pull me off my bed and onto the floor in the middle of my room and stare into my soul as I kept my eyes closed in sheer terror. My mom would later recount several times in which she would walk into my room and see me lying in the middle of the room on my back. She would ask me what I'm doing, to which I would essentially snap out of it and tell her I was fine, too scared to talk about what had happened. I remember if I slept on my chest, I would feel like a force would pick me up, two to three feet, buy my shirt and drop me back onto my bed. This happened so often that to this day, I am reluctant to sleep on my chest, not because I'm afraid I'll be picked up, I'm now a 220 pound adult man, good luck, but because something in my subconscious mind tells me that it's not a good position to be in. My parents would tell me that I just had nightmares all the time, but they did not realize this nightmare was something I had experienced every night. Years later, having endured this every night, I began to see an additional apparition in the home. I began to see a young boy in the long stretch of a narrow hallway that my bedroom was situated in. I would see him peeking out of different rooms at me while I was in the hallway, then disappear out of sight into rooms, only to see he had disappeared completely upon my investigation. That would be the extent of my interaction with him, but I would see him often and only during the daytime. The apparition did not appear to be malicious, unlike the other figure that tormented me at night. He gave me the impression he was merely an observer, which was comforting in a way, that this ghost did not want to mess with me unlike the Crypt Keeper entity. Over a decade later, now living in Atlanta, I decided to look up the address on Google Maps to show a friend and notice that the home was now the site of a home business. Upon seeing that, I decided that I would reach out to them out of curiosity and see if they had any similar experiences. The business would later reply, saying that there were frequent electrical issues, and that other strange things occurred frequently. He told me that his wife and kids complained about seeing a little boy wandering around the hallway and were scared to live in the home. The man also described seeing a tall shadow occasionally when he was working in his office, which turned out to be my old bedroom. He told me he always felt like he was being watched and felt generally uneasy in that room in particular. What is peculiar about this is I had not described any of my experiences before him telling me this, yet our stories appeared to line up perfectly. I showed my parents the message thread I had with this business, and it was then that they confirmed that they believed the house was haunted. They didn't want to say anything that would scare me even more, and tried to bury it under the guise that it was having nightmares. My mother said that she would see the same little boy wandering around the kitchen and hallway, and she always had the feeling of being watched when no one was home but her. Neither of them had seen the tall figure, and it seemed it was focused on me. The experiences I had in that home are permanently burned into my mind, and I will never forget that tall, wired-haired figure that constantly picked me up, laid on me, and pulled me around, terrifying me to the core. I don't plan to ever return to that home, and I pray that no one who has the misfortune of living there experiences what I did on a nightly basis for six freaking years. I've always been curious about deep hypnosis, and what it may reveal to me, but I'm equally terrified to remember events that my mind deemed too traumatic to keep from my conscious mind. Case Notes, File Number 54 My god, what a distressing childhood this must have been for you. I used to think there weren't any malevolent spirits, but I'm not sure this is the case anymore. This is more than just wanting to hurt you too, it was pure psychological torment. Sadistic. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like, and also subscribe on up. Case file number 55, written by user PotatoPixie9210. One more step down the stairs, then her husband was petrified. Let's get into it. Let me preface this by saying that there always were creepy happenings around me, and I have several stories of my dad's old house, which me and my siblings all agree is haunted as hell. 
I also had a dead best friend visit me twice, which was nice. So this evening, my partner, 42 male, and I, 30 female, were upstairs sorting laundry when his daughter, 17, called us downstairs as dinner was ready. I was heading down the stairs, my partner right behind me, literally two steps behind me. He did his usual thing of tickling the back of my neck as we walked. The bottom of our stairs is wooden, so you can hear when somebody steps onto it from the carpeted stairs. When we got to the bottom, my feet hit the floor as usual. I turned to ask him something, and he wasn't there. He wasn't freaking there! I totally froze for a second and looked up the stairs and there he was, on the top step, pale and shaking. I asked him what the hell just happened and he kept saying, I don't know, I was behind you and before I hit the bottom, the next step I took took me back upstairs. We were very freaked out. We didn't say anything to our girl as she was already very leery of stuff like this, although he and I are somewhat used to it. I'm trying to get the courage to leave my laptop recording audio overnight because there is something weird happening. Edited to add, I was just talking to my partner about the jump while we were cleaning our bedroom and the second he made a joke about spooks a poppin, our bedroom and bathroom door just slammed shut one after the other. I'm chalking it up to our bedroom window being open a crack. I don't want to think about alternatives. Case Notes, file number 55. So I'm just curious, how many sets of stairs does your staircase have? I'm thinking of course, the longer the staircase, the more bewildering this is. I saw a comment asking if your husband would prank you out this way, and you said that it doesn't seem like his character to do that. Not in a perpetual type of prank, like you never tell them it was a prank, leaving you in this state of unease and fear in your own home. Besides, you'd have heard him if he tried to sprint up a few flights of stairs, no doubt. Unless he's secretly Batman, of course. This is such a strange glitch. Did your husband notice the teleportation, for lack of a better word? Did he feel a force move him, or was he just instantaneously appearing at the top? The author responded to my comment, saying, So our stairs are made up of 10 steps, with another 3 curved ones at the top that lead to the landing. My partner is very big, built like a bear of a man, approximately 6 foot 4 inches tall. He's quite heavy on his feet. It's a joke in our house that if he's working the night shift, we use his footsteps at 5am as our alarm clock. He is a prankster, but never on stairs or anywhere that would lead to an accident or harm. He has had a recurring dream where he falls and breaks his neck, so he definitely wouldn't ever do it on stairs. His pranks consist more of the wrap your pillows and toilet roll, tie all your socks together into a snake, or put googly eyes on all your special yogurts thing. On top of that, he knows well that I've had weird experiences. He'd never use them as a prank, certainly never to leave me feeling anxious and have me standing squinting at our stairs every so often. I'm not religious, but I am spiritual, and I know he would never use that belief in a joke. As for what he felt, he just said he took a step as usual, then felt like he had missed a step. That weird lurching feeling in his stomach we all get when we miss a step. He said when his foot hit the step, he was back at the top of the stairs. He felt nothing except shock as to how the hell he got back up the entire flight of stairs to end up on the very first curved step. Maybe our stairs are cursed because of having 13 steps. <laughs> So back to my thoughts real quick, uh, just to say that the fact that the steps are curved at the top lends even more credibility to this because the momentum would be conserved. You couldn't sprint up the stairs and then turn at a sharp angle and all be silent at the same time. None of this makes any sense at all in that context. Very weird, isn't it? He just teleported up 12 steps to the top instantaneously. Why and how? Was it actually a ghost or some kind of entity? And why? I wonder. What do you think? Case file number 56, written by user October Times. What seems to be their home, haunted, persists with many terrifying incidents. Let's get into it. 
The home we lived in for over seven years had something demonic that didn't like my kids. When we first moved in, single mom of three, we constantly would see dark shadows float from one room to the next. We'd hear odd noises and always had our belongings misplaced. Mind you, this happened the first few years of living there. As the years passed on, we became accustomed to such events and tried to pay no mind to them being scared silly and praying the episode or experience would hurry up and pass. Fast forward, I met and married my husband. This guy, note the past tense, was a non-believer of anything paranormal, until it started messing with him too. One evening I awoke to my eldest daughter, 17 at the time, screaming bloody murder from her bedroom. We slept with all our bedroom doors open, one story, newer built home. I rushed to her room and turned on the light, only to see my husband, her stepdad, standing at the end of her bed. Motherly first instinct, I'm about to mess him up if he was messing with my daughter. She was crying so loud and shaking as I ran to her and hugged her. I screamed at my husband but he stood blank faced, staring at my daughter. I yelled again, what the hell did you do to her? He snaps out of his trance and my daughter calms down. She said she woke up to him floating by the bed, that his head was close to the ceiling. My husband did not even recall waking up, or walking, or knowing anything that had occurred at all. We all slept in the living room after that. A few weeks later, my daughter, the same one, advised she couldn't sleep because of the growling and scratching in the corner of her room. She would sleep in the living room until she moved out a year later. Whatever it was, ended up bothering my 11 year old son as well. He would cry and say how it would growl in his ear, scratch by his bed, and bang his window. He ended up in the living room as his sleeping headquarters, or would sleep with his other sister. Fast forward another year, our last week living there, we got our stuff and moved the hell out due to what happened next. My husband would go to work by 5am, as such, he would be getting ready by 3am. On this particular morning, he got up, went to shower, always would close the French doors between the room and restroom to avoid waking me. As he was showering, I'm woken up by all six windows in a room being knocked on. It sounded like someone or something was at the windows knocking. I jumped out of bed, ran to the restroom and told my husband someone was in our backyard. My husband, who was already dressed by this time, grabs his gun we live in Texas, runs outside to check, but found nothing. As soon as we were in our room again, the windows were knocked on once more. Keep in mind, they're all being knocked on at the same freaking time. My husband runs out again and starts yelling, thinking someone must be messing with us. But nothing is there, nada was found. He gives me some unlikely story about maybe it being wind and hurries out the door since he was running late. Not 30 minutes later, as I'm lying in bed thinking about the window crap, I hear a big crash in the kitchen. I run out of my room to see what happened, turned on all the lights, open concept home remember, to see all my pots and pans from cabinets on the kitchen floor and in the living room. I called my husband, scared out of my mind. As I'm on the phone with him, my son runs into the living room where I'm at and climbs on me, burying his face on my shoulder. He's stuttering to say that something grabbed him by the ankles and pulled him off his bed. As he's telling me this, I can hear sounds coming from his room. I wake up my middle daughter, 15 at the time, as her room was adjacent to his. My husband, still on the phone, tells me to grab the gun, which I did and both my kids are behind me as we walk towards my son's room. As we approached, we can hear as if someone is in the room either breaking in or flipping the room upside down. I yelled for whoever it was. I am on the phone with the police and I have a loaded gun. The lights were still off. I get brave and flick the switch, only for the noises to stop and the room looks normal. I check the closet, under the bed and confirm the windows are secured and locked up. No one was in there. My husband hung up as he's clocking into work. My kids and I all get out of the house immediately after this. 
We drove around until daylight, looking for churches open that could provide holy water. That week, we packed our stuff and left the home, permanently. Case Notes, file number 56. It's that feeling of being invaded, in that one place that's supposed to represent absolute security and safety. Your home, your castle, your sanctuary. Under unclear assault, you don't even know what's going on. It's almost cruel. I'm thinking these forces, or demons, whatever you want to call them, they enjoy the torment that it causes. Not just in the moment, but those thoughts that linger on that it'll happen again. I'm curious though, did moving fix it? Do you think it was just your house that was haunted, or did whatever it was follow you to your new place? The author responded to my comment, saying, Agreed. The negative energy tends to feed off torment. I also believe that, for the most part, the entity or negative energy felt that since we really didn't know how to fix the matter, it somehow grew stronger from our lack of knowledge for things of that nature. We did attempt to bless the home ourselves, holy water and even sage, but we encountered even more happenings from it afterwards. To a normal person who is clueless on such, questions arise of what else is there or how else can we approach this? The extreme happenings were random and not often compared to the shadows or noises and misplaced items. Toward the end is when it got aggressive. The growling and scratches, odors, and throwing of stuff is what really gave us a sense that we really needed to move. After we moved, our new place has been great to us. Whatever it was, didn't follow us. Case file number 57, written by user Cole3G. Picking up a package at Whole Foods, sees a strange man. Moments later, he vanished completely. What happened? This happened to me several days ago, and I'm still unsure what to think about it. I was at Whole Foods to pick up an Amazon package, because they have the pickup lockers right outside the entrance in the parking garage. I walk up to the lockers, and this guy is standing right in front of them, just staring straight ahead. He doesn't acknowledge me, so I ask him if he needs any help. Nothing, no response. Doesn't even seem like he heard me. Just keeps staring ahead, not blinking or moving. So I go inside the store to get an employee. Maybe they can call for medical or police help. Also, so I can safely get my package. While talking with the employee, another shopper overheard me and said, I'm glad you said something because I saw him too when I came in and thought it was creepy. That was about 20 minutes ago. The employee comes out with me and asks the man to leave, but he just keeps staring. I get my package and get in my car, which is parked right in front, so I can still see him. I see the employee go back inside, probably to call the police. I look down for maybe 5 seconds to start my car, look back up, and he's gone. I see the employee come back out and looking confused. He starts walking around the parking garage to see where the guy went, but he can't find him. There's nowhere he could have gone in the few seconds I was looking away. There were only a few other cars in the garage, none of which were occupied. I don't know what to make of it. My friend suggested he was on drugs, but he didn't seem like it. Clean clothes, fit and healthy looking, no cracked out eyes or anything. Wondering if anyone has experienced something similar. Case Notes, file number 57. It sounds like the man was asleep, almost like he was sleepwalking. But as you say, he was properly dressed. You said there's nowhere he could have gone within this parking garage, so there were no corners he could have rounded quickly. If not, then it seems like it was a simple case of astral projection. But it does seem it was accidental, of course. If I'm guessing correctly, this man didn't even realize he was doing it at all. He may still not even know he did it. What do you think? Case file number 58, written by user me and the boys. He watched a boy get into an enclosed water slide, only the boy disappeared. What happened? When I was a teenager, I worked as a lifeguard in a water park. We had five water slides that started from this one tower and ended at a single pool that was within line of sight, but with the layout of the park, it was a few minutes walk from the slide pool to the top of the slides again. 
One lifeguard sat at the top of the tower, and another would be at the pool at the bottom, so we would signal to each other if someone was messing around on the way down, or if we needed to pause the line for any reason. With the layout of the park, you could not just see the slide pool, but see the entire park from the top of the slide tower. You could even see someone as they walked the entire path from the slide pool up to the slide tower again. The last two hours of the day were always really slow on the slides, so I would frequently skip my breaks to sit on top and twiddle my thumbs for the remainder of my shift. Anyways, it's about 30 minutes before closing. I'm doing my thing, chilling on the top of the slides. Only two kids, a boy and a girl, were going down the slides and coming back up since there was no line at this point. As I said, it was a long walk, so the boy would come up and go, then about two minutes later the girl would come up and go too, two minutes later the boy again, etc. Well, the boy comes back up, and he goes down slide 2. Slide 2 is completely enclosed, very fast, it's under a 20 second ride, and has about a 24 inch diameter. I'm bored, so I lean over the rails, watching the bottom, and never see the boy come out of the slide. A minute later, the girl comes up, and she says she wants to go down slide 2. I tell her to wait a minute and have her wait while I watch for the boy to come out, but he never does. After a solid 2 minutes from me sending him down, keep in mind, it's a fully enclosed 20 second ride, I radio the guard at the bottom and ask if the boy came out, the guard says he never did. Then I scan over the entire park. There are maybe 20 people in the park at this time of day, and I don't see the boy anywhere. At this point I'm just getting confused, but chalk it up to the boy coming down, jumping out of the side of the pool, and going to the nearby bathroom. After finally concluding I must be crazy, I send the girl down slide 2. Sure enough, 20 seconds later, the girl comes out of the slide and runs off, no issue. A few minutes later, the girl comes back up goes down slide 2 again, and comes right back out 20 seconds later. So I go back to waiting for the next person to come up the slide tower, when all of a sudden, the boy comes out of the bottom of slide 2. It had been at least 10 minutes since I had sent him down, and the girl had gone through that slide as normal 2 times in those 10 minutes. To this day, I just can't figure out what happened. As I said, slide 2 is fast, narrow, and fully enclosed. There's no way to stop yourself on the way down. Trust me, I've tried. And even if he did manage to stop himself, there's no way that girl could have passed by him at all, let alone unimpeded in the normal 20 seconds. This boy just disappeared off the face of the earth for 10 minutes, and respawned in the middle of slide 2 like nothing at all had happened. I've gone over it in my head many times, and to this day, still have no clue what happened to that boy for those 10 minutes. Case Notes, file number 58. So per the layout of your story, I can't see any explanation besides a time slip. And per the comments here, it seems to be related with your specific water park. How many of these time slips result in missing 411 cases, I wonder? What if many children or even adults aren't being abducted by people or aliens? but they're simply stuck out of sync with the rest of us. Unfortunately, you couldn't talk to the kid after to get his perspective. I wonder how it felt for him. Seems like he's basically in suspended animation until he re-emerges. Or is it just full time travel, actually teleporting into the future? He doesn't exist in those moments until he reappeared. I suppose it doesn't change much for the person it's happening to, but the actual physical process would be very different. Hmm. It's just weird, why happen here in a water park? Apparently someone else has seen this happen in the same water park, which is just baffling, there's something about this physical location. What do you think? Case file number 59, written by user GD Panda. She saw a homeless man, one she knew visually. Somehow, she passed by him twice, trying to avoid him, only for him to reappear in front of her. I live in a city that still has small town vibes. You get to know all the beggars and the homeless over time. You learn their names, if they're dangerous or not, and just their stories in general. There are a couple that I avoid because they seem very violent, 
including this one skinhead with large swastika tattoos on his shoulder and chest. Imagine Edward Norton in American History X. He is though, as such, extremely distinctive. He always has the same story about why he needs money. His daughter was in a car accident and he needs taxi money to go to the hospital. I can spot him from far away and always cross the street. One summer afternoon, it was extremely hot and humid. I was sitting in a pocket park on my lunch break. A pocket park is usually between two streets and very small. I see him walking up the sidewalk towards me. I wanted to get up and leave but I was scared to have my back to him. I waited for him to pass me and he started with his story. I said, Hey man, you've told me this story before more than once. I don't have anything to offer and maybe figure out a new sob story. I can see he's wearing an old Budweiser wife beater, baggy blue jeans with a long wallet chain, and has a blue cast on his right arm. He walks past me, towards, we'll say Main Street. He stops at the end of the park sidewalk, where there's a man he's bothering. I use that time to hurry past him. He's on my right, so I go left. I'm walking along Main Street to the intersection of Main and East. I take a right so Maine is now behind me. I'm walking fast so I can lose him. I'm halfway down the street when I see him take a right on east, about 100 yards away, walking towards me. He walks right past me towards Maine, not even looking at me, not even sweaty, and asks me for money with the same story. I lived and worked on that block for years, there's no shortcut. Even running at full speed, it would take a few minutes to get ahead of me, then turn around and walk past me. There's no physical way to make that happen. And he's so distinctive looking, I've seen him for years, I know it was him. He did have the same story too. It's like a copy of him just repeated his program. And after that day, I never saw him again. Case Notes, file number 59. This just feels like timelines converging together, or maybe indeed it was just a copy. The odd thing is that you never saw him again though after this, almost like he phased out of your reality completely. Maybe some people are actually, I mean not even to be rude, just thinking out loud, like some people are NPCs, they're not real like players as part of this simulation game, and they're just people we need to encounter, or maybe they're challenges, just to see how we interact in that way. Maybe you need to interact with people like this for some step in your life, maybe it aligns your mind in a specific way, if that makes any sense at all. Huh. What do you think? Case file number 60, written by user SilverArrow05. He was around 8 years old, playing in his basement, but something else was nearby too, watching him. When I was around 6 or 8 years old, I would come down into my basement to play games with my younger brother all the time. He was around 5 or 7 at the time. We were playing Minecraft Xbox 360 edition and were messing around in creative mode when the world generation started to bug out. Half iron doors generating in mountainsides and corrupt villages were loading in. My brother thought it looked a little weird and he left to use the restroom. While he was in there, the TV started to show static and it began to make an alien roaring sound. The lights in my basement flickered and the Xbox shut off on its own, and it never worked again after this. It freaked me out. I got this horrifying sense that something evil was coming. I looked over towards the wall and saw this black shadowy figure clawing out of the wall. It had these piercing, almost glowing eyes and when it saw me, it ran straight through a wall and I could see it standing in the darkness through an open door. I ran up to my parents crying, and don't kill me for this, I was little and didn't know better, and I told them there was a black guy that came through the basement wall. They didn't know how to react to this, so they went downstairs with me and showed me that there was nothing there. I was too afraid to go downstairs alone for the next couple of months. A couple of years later, my parents had their friends over and they brought their kids. We all went downstairs and I told them what I told you above. We decided it would be cool to have a ghost hunt. 
we set a ghost trap by coating the floor with marbles and put a Lincoln log house in the middle of the room. I thought it was meant so it would want to break the house, and when it did, it would trip and fall so we would hear it. We went upstairs for some drinks, and when we went back downstairs, there was a clear path through the marbles going to the now completely demolished Lincoln house. The pieces were blasted across the room, and back into the room I saw it run into the first time. My friends were now convinced of its existence as well. A few days ago, this is what made me remember all of this, because it was a while ago. I had this creepy nightmare where there were tons of shadow people standing around my bed, and when I would close my eyes, I could see right through them, and I couldn't look away. They weren't hurting me, just really creeping me out. Oh, and in case this means anything, I sleep in my basement right now, next to the room where I saw it run into. Occasionally, I can hear knocking on the wall where I first saw it, and other sounds coming from that room. And yes, still to this day, I can see it just out of the corner of my eye in my peripheral vision, darting around in that room, and also when all the lights are off in my basement. Has anyone else experienced anything similar to this? And should I be worried about it? Because it doesn't seem to be bothering anyone. Case Notes, File Number 60 Personally, I get the impression that shadow people aren't demons or malevolent. They don't intend us harm. They're the essence of people trapped within dead pockets of other universes. They're only able to loosely interact with us, but not able to cross back over. It's just my little speculative theory, but I think it does fit well. Though I am curious how its appearance affected your Xbox as a kid, somehow it caused a short. The same thing happened with the lights, it seems that shadow people can interact, likely in my opinion by accident, with the electromagnetic force. If this is true, that must be a sort of hell that they can't escape from. I don't know, but it's my theory. If you like this video, give it a like, and also subscribe on up.